Take your Bible, if you would, turn there what I have up on the screen. Let me go back for a second. Oh, yeah, not yet. Don't turn there yet. Turn, turn to John chapter 10. And uh, appreciate everybody coming. Good to see we got some visitors this morning. want you to feel at home. Make yourself welcome. Make yourself at home. Be comfortable. Write down anybody's name that is mean to you and turn it into me. We'll deal with it. Uh, Lisa and I got a starting to get a busy summer going. Um, we are going to go uh, down to uh, Brother Reg Kelly's camp meeting uh, the weekend of Memorial Day <clears throat> on a Friday and Saturday. We'll be back. And then uh, we're going to take <clears throat> a little vacation and go up north and then end that vacation in uh, Cincinnati. And I'll be speaking there for uh, Southwest Radio uh, Friday and Saturday. And you'll have a preacher here Sunday because I won't be able to make it back in time. And um, then after that, we have uh, camp coming up in June. Uh, let's see here, July, we're going to take another vacation. And then August is coming, and what's in August? Homecoming! First, first year I put that up on the internet that we're going to have a Bethel homecoming. Somebody wrote, I think they were from England, what is a homecoming? And somebody wrote, it's the second home game after the football season starts in high school. <laughs> no, that's not it. It goes back farther than that when families sort of dispersed out. Well, the family head, the patriarch, and would call for a homecoming. That would be all the relatives coming in. They would get together sort of like a family reunion is what it is. And uh, we love our homecomings. And what, what's the dates on that? August 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 3rd, 4th, 5th, something like that. First, first weekend of August is usually what it is. And um, so we've already had, uh, I've already had several preachers contact me about coming to homecoming. And... Um, so, uh, looking forward to that. And then they plan on bringing some of the folk from their church. So, we, uh, we've had several inquiries about homecoming. We might have a pretty good crowd this year. Uh, yeah, I hope so. Co COVID really hurt us. And uh, so, anyway, we look forward to that. And it's just a time of Bible teaching and fellowship and pulled pork. Amen. Doesn't get any better than that. All right, John chapter 10. I'm going to read this just by way of uh, introduction to the message. Uh, this message I started last Sunday morning. It has to do uh, with the, the idea of walls, barriers, gates, fences, um, ways of keeping bad things out or bad things people and ways of keeping good things in along with good people you believe it or not as pastor I've had to go to some people and say to them you are not a good fit for our church now, if that shocks you, understand that I might know some things about people that you don't know. And it'll be based, it'll be based on that. that. The fact that you don't know it means that I've done my duty in keeping my mouth shut by making things private. There are people's, I don't, I don't want to ruin somebody's life. I don't want to degrade them, 
But I've had people that literally, a man brought his family here, moved here from Pennsylvania. And within just a matter of a couple of months, he's coming in to me, saying to me, Pastor Mike, I'm having problems. What is it? He said, I just cannot get the people in this church to live the way I think they ought to live. That was his exact words. And I knew that it was a problem. And I said to him, who said it was your responsibility? I said, I don't even think it's my responsibility most of the time unless they come to me and ask me. Or it's some serious sin that I have to deal with. And caught him in several lies. I didn't, I didn't ask him to leave that Sunday. But just in a matter of weeks, I finally had to call him and his wife in and say to them, I am not, I am not a good pastor for you and this is not a good church for you. I'm going to ask you guys to go somewhere else. Just so that you'll understand, he told me that they had been asked to leave five churches before they came here. Then he went to another church in this town and the pastor is a good friend of mine. Six months later, the pastor called me and said, Mike, do you know such and such family? I said, yeah. And he said, what do you know about him? And I told him, he said, I'm going to have to do a church discipline on them and probably have them leave because they're causing trouble, a lot of trouble. And understand that not everybody that comes in here is looking for salvation, looking for help, looking to fellowship with everybody. The devil will send wolves in that are dressed how? As sheep. And it is my responsibility to protect the flock. So there are guidelines. Rules have been established by the word of God on how we are to live our lives. And see, I've had people who are sitting in this room right now come to me and confess certain things that are going, is going on in their life. Not, not good things. I didn't run them out. I didn't put them out on the street. I didn't bring them out here and say, look at this, look at him. Let me tell you what they're doing. I didn't do that. The fact that you don't know it means that I've done my job. Kept it, kept it quiet, kept it private. Some things are private. It's not everybody's business. And I've heard of churches where they literally will drag people out in front of the church like those Jewish men drug that woman caught in adultery out before Jesus and say, you going to stone her or what? What did Jesus do? Forgave her sins, didn't he? No need for stoning. Now the sins are gone. And that's happened. Like I say, there are people in this room right now. I've had people come to me. Close family. You're not doing right. And uh, it's a humbling experience. But it works. It's God's way of taking care of things that need to be taken care of. Because we're all still sinners. Amen? Everybody here needs guidelines, barriers, walls, rules, ordinances, statutes, God's law. To keep us where we need to be. In that context, let's read this. John chapter 10 verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Notice how Jesus comes in straight away. What's that verse in Revelation where Jesus said, Behold, I sneak in the window. That's not what he said, is it, Chris? He said, behold, I stand at the door and... Who is it? It's Jesus. If any man will open unto me, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. It's done with your approval, your permission. When Jesus came to you, he knocked on your door and said, will you let me in? And you let him in. Amen. That's how it's supposed to work. 
To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice, and a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were, which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that, listen to what he said now, I'm the door. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Where Jesus said, verse 9, I am the door if any man, by me if any man enter in. You know, I'm just guessing that maybe at one point, Billy Graham may have preached this message and said that the only door to salvation is Jesus. And yet in his latter years, he turned against that. He got on the, um, oh, who was that guy? Uh, uh, Robert Schuller. Out in California, big crystal cathedral out there, or something like that. And he was on the phone with Robert Schuler at his church, and they were having a church service. And Billy Graham confirmed to Robert Schuler that he believed that there were other ways to salvation, and that the Muslim worships the same God as we do. And of course, Robert Schuler is about to wet himself over this. He just thinks that's great and lovely and Oh, it's so wonderful to hear you say that. You cut me up with a hatchet if I ever say that there's any other way other than Jesus Christ. Let me hear you say amen. amen. It is exclusive with Jesus. It is not by Mary. It's not by the Pope. It's not by the preacher. It's not by the pew member. It's not by the church or the religion or the denomination. It is by Jesus and Jesus alone that we enter in and we shall be saved. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 26, 1. In that day shall this song be sung. Let me do this real quick. The sweat season has started officially with me. Isaiah 26, 1. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. What I want is a strong church led by strong men, not men wannabes, not transgendered men, a church led by strong men who are leading their families with wisdom and love and care. The way you want me to lead this church with wisdom and love and care. Amen. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. I don't know if you are really aware of this. But there are people in this church that are wearing guns. There's a man out there in the foyer who's watching the doors in the parking lot. To make sure that you people in here are safe and we can have church. You say, I, I don't like that. What, you want somebody to come in here and shoot the place up? Because they do that now in churches, don't they? Huh? No, uh-uh. Royal pulled his bullet out and let him have it. Yeah, build it, we gave him. But we have walls around the place and the door's locked. Because we're in here. Now, if somebody really wants in, we let them in. If they want to come in here and have church, we'll have church with them. But there'll be somebody watching them. Till we get to know them, amen. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Isaiah 60, verse 18. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land. Wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. That's twice now. That's twice in the Bible that God said that salvation 
is accomplished with borders, with walls, with gates, with guards, and so on. Now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. You pray for me while I preach this message. All right, Heavenly Father, I pray to God, Lord, that you would bless this. And whatever effort and whatever strength I have or don't have, I pray, Father, that you would be strong in my place. And preach to these people on the inside what I preach to their ears. May the Holy Spirit of God go throughout this congregation. Go to out all of those who are watching and listening. Even days, weeks, months and years later. Somebody might be listening to this message online. But watching it online. And may your Holy Spirit work in them. The things that you want to work in us. Help us, dear God, to understand the value of your law, your rules, your guidelines being our safety, our protection. Your barriers keeping us from things that we ought not be a part of. Guidelines and statutes to keep us from destroying that or to keep the devil from destroying in us the thing, Lord, that you seek to build in us. As you protected Israel of old. As you encompassed Elisha and his servant. With angels of horses and chariots of fire. Saying to him there be more with us than there are with them. Father may you protect each and every one. Who is part of this service this morning. Protect and guard their heart. From going astray. Their heart from going astray. Father, I pray to your God that each and every one of us, Lord, would seek after you. And say, God, you protect me. You keep me in. You keep me away from things that I don't need to be a part of. Things I need to get rid of. God, would you do that for me? Father, I pray that you'd bless this message now. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Last week I started on this. Turn to Jeremiah 1. I'm going to show you this. This blessed my heart uh, when, I, when I saw this. I, I was just like, wow. Jeremiah chapter 1. The gist of where I'm going with this is, is that yes, God has his law as a barrier to us. When Israel left Egypt, they left government. There was no government over them. The animal kingdom, by and large, I guess they're governed by instinct and by nature. Uh, Jesus said foxes have holes and birds have nests. You don't see foxes sitting up in nests and birds you don't see cli climbing in holes. Um, every sort of animal has a way that God put in them and they just don't usually go against the nature that is in them. And yet God opened up a door for us as humans that nothing else in his creation has, no matter how intelligent the creature. And that is, we have the ability to choose between what nature we want to be a part of, whether a sin nature or what the Bible calls the divine nature. That means you are, you are living for Christ, Christ dwells in you, the Holy Spirit guides you, and the things that you used to do, God has put it in you to where you don't want to do them anymore. He takes the cravings away, as it were. He takes the, uh, the yearning for sin away, as it were. And, and God builds that in us, and He does it through His law. And so when Israel crossed the Red Sea, God, before God took them any place else, he said, we need a government. We need laws. We need guidelines. We need rules. So he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Writing them on tablets of stone on the front and on the back, on both tablets, so that A, they're written in stone, meaning no man can erase them. B, written on the front and the back so that no man could add to them. God's pretty smart, isn't he? The older I get, the wiser God is. Amen. Uh, so he's pretty smart. But he gave them barriers. 
He said, when you go into this land, you, I don't just want you doing whatever you want to do. If you married a wife, keep her. If you're raising children, raise them right. If you have something that belongs to somebody else, give it back or that's stealing. If you take something that doesn't belong to you, that's stealing and there's punishment for that. If you kill somebody, then you will be killed. God put rules and, this is important, God put punishment for those rules. What good are rules? Listen to me, moms and dads. I grew up, we didn't have riddling, we had paddling. <laughs> Amen. And I was one of those, if I got a whipping at school, I got one at home. And I heard one time that the school called my mom to tell her I got a whipping. So I'd get off the bus or the van and I'd tell her, Mom, I got in trouble today. Hoping I could stave it off. Didn't work. Then I tried this. I just got home and didn't say nothing. I found out the school didn't call. Oh. <laughs> Moving right along. But we had rules. We had guidelines. And we had parents that if we broke the rules, there was punishment for it. Rules are no good if they have no teeth. Laws and statutes, we've got laws and statutes in this country. We don't need more laws. We don't need more gun laws. We just need to uh, enact the laws that are on the books. The law needs to be spread out evenly for all people in this country, whether they are rich, powerful, or politicians, or just plain folk. Amen to that? Amen to that. It's time we started holding some elected officials and unelected officials accountable. They feel like they can just break the law whenever they want to, that all that money that comes in through tax money belongs to them. It doesn't. It's we the Thank you very much. Now, look, take a look at this verse. I thought of Israel when I saw this. Jeremiah chapter 1. This picture that you see there on the screen. Does anybody know what that is? Yep. That is Israel's iron dome. That was successful to about 95 to 98% of all the missiles that Iran sent over. The iron dome got most of them. So that it would not kill any of the Israelis. Yeah, yeah. He told, he, uh, he told us, Roy, not to tell who did it. Whoops! It's on you now, Jack. Yeah. Read this verse. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. You know what? Hey, can I throw this in? You know what it means to gird up your loins? It means, men, when you get up, Pull your pants up. Listen, men, gird up. Listen, you want a good job? Pull your pants up, gird up your loins, amen. I just can't find a job anywhere. Lisa, I don't know, Lisa saw it. I don't know, I didn't see it. She said, my goodness, that boy had his pants pulled down so far, it was below his underwear. I, I'd like to see a cop chase that guy. <laughs> Running like Lou Costello. Hey, let's read this. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city. And an iron, look at that, iron pillar. And it just made me think of that Iron Dome. 
and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. And if you think that only applies to Israel, well, guess what? If you're saved, you're Israel. You are the Israel of God, and God makes the promise to you, I'll fight for you, I will keep you, I will prevail against those that prevail against you, I will be with you always, somebody say amen. amen. See, it's pretty good staying inside them walls, isn't it? Because God's on our side, and we know it. Oh, I like this. Turn your Bible to Isaiah 49. I want you to underline this verse. I want you to underline it. And I want you to write a note because I'm fixing to blow you away with something. Isaiah 49. Some of you might know this, might remember I've talked about it before. But I'm going to give you something that will just wow you. All right? Or I think, I hope it will. Isaiah 49. Let's read verse uh, 14. But Zion said, the Lord hath forsaken me. And my Lord hath forgotten me. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever been in a place where you felt that maybe God forgot you? I'm raising my hand. It's natural. It happens. But look at the next verse. Can a woman forget her sucking child? No. That's why God put a squeal in every baby. Amen? Amen. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Notice the next verse. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Now I read that one time. And I started looking at my hand, because we're made in the image of God. And I've, I've done some study on palm reading. It's a form of divination, where supposedly, okay, this is your lifeline, this is your love line, and you're going to live this long, and you're going to marry this. and That's a bunch of hooey. There's nothing to it. But God said that he's graven them in the palm of his hand. And I was, I was looking at my hand. I just was looking at it. And I, I finally said, God, I don't get that. What do you mean by that? And the Holy Ghost said, read that verse again. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. <clears throat> Thy walls are continually before me. And then I got it. Turn to Revelation 21 and write in Isaiah 49, Revelation 21. You're going you're gonna to have your own um, reference Bible by the time you're done with me. You'll have a whole reference Bible of one place you're reading something and then you read it somewhere else in Scripture. Revelation 21, verse 10. He carried me away. This is New Jerusalem. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a what? Even New Jerusalem has walls around it. Had a wall, great and high, and it had how many gates? Twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. Now, look at your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. He said, every time I look and I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, I remember the gates and the walls of Israel. And he wrote their names of each tribe on each gate. And he said, I look at my hand and I'll never forget you. I wrote it on my hand. Amen. 
You'll never forget that now as long as you live. See, you didn't evolve from some monkey. Amen? Most of you. Now, this goes back to last week. Proverbs 25, 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. And that, notice that the word walls is mentioned 66 times in the Bible. or 66 books in this Bible. So it's a, walls are a reference to the word of God. We are to follow the whole counsel of God. I don't want to hear anybody say, well, that's under the law, and we're not under the law anymore. What I want to hear is, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. If God said, thou shalt not commit adultery, I'm not going to say, well, that's under the law. If God said, thou shalt not kill, I don't want to hear, well, that's under the law. If God said, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, I don't want to hear, that's under the law. If God said, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, I don't want to hear anybody say, well, that's under the law. I can do whatever I want to, and I'm still saved. I don't want to hear that. Jesus gave us two rules, and he said, in those two, encompass all the law and the prophets. Thou shalt love the, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, you will not have any other gods before him. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, you will not say his name in vain. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, you will not make unto you a graven image. You will not covet, which Paul said was idolatry. If you love your neighbor, you will not steal your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's daughter. If you love your neighbor, you will not take something from your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you will not bear false witness against your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you'll do those things that are written in the law. So technically... Jesus gave us two commandments, and uh, I think we ought to follow them. Amen? But he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that's broken down and without walls. Now, I read Ezekiel 13, at least part of it last week, and I'm going to go here for time's sake. I want you to turn to Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. You might get out of here before 12.30. Maybe. We'll see how it goes. Proverbs 24. Now, you're not going to beat First Baptist to uh, Bob Evans. You're not going to beat Second Baptist to uh, Texas Roadhouse. But I can get you to McDonald's in time. Proverbs 24, verse 30. I want you to take note of this. Okay? Let me ask you a question. Those of you who have been drunk or drank alcohol before or taken drugs before. Most drugs are classified as narcotic, which basically means they make you sleepy. Am I right on that? Marijuana does it. Makes you droopy-eyed, stupid-looking. Um, various prescription drugs, codeine, benzos, they make you slothful. Isn't that true? Whiskey, vodka, Everclear, beer, wine, strong drink, the Bible calls it. Makes you go to sleep. Makes you drag your feet. Makes you slur your speech. It makes you slothful. So I went by the field of the slothful. And by the vineyard. Now, the vineyard is a very important word in the Bible. Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, ye are the branches. If any man abide in me, and my word abide in him, he shall ask the Father what he will, and he shall grant it to him. 
But if you do not, if the branches do not abide in the vine, Jesus said, the husbandman will take them, cut them off, cast them into the fire to be burned. We all know what that is. The vineyard represents all the things that we've inherited from God, like the word of God. The vineyard, a vine, looks like DNA on purpose. It is then applied to families. You men, you are the governor of your family. I don't want to hear your 21st century feminist ideology. We're finding out that it doesn't work, does it? You know what women are going online and complaining about? Young women, they can't find a decent husband anymore. Nobody will date them. One guy, he went on a, on a like a, I don't know, a, I guess a, a blind date using one of those apps. He picks this woman up. She immediately starts complaining to him. And fussing at him. And then he told her he was taking her to some nice steakhouse. And she's like, really? You couldn't afford to take me downtown to Robert's or some kind of thing like that? You're taking me for a steak? And he like pulled the car into the parking lot, turned around and took her back home and said, get out of my car. And then she got on and said, oh, he treated me so bad. I can't find nobody. That's because you insist on being this feminazi and no man in his right mind would have you. So let's leave the feminism out of it. You are not lesser than, ladies. You're equal to, but different. Women are different. Do I have to say that? Women are different? Apparently I do. But men... God has made you the governor. Now that does not mean the governor doesn't need input. God said it is not good for the man to be alone. Ladies, you are the helper of that man. God will use both of you together to do great things for the kingdom of God and for your family. But you have to be together. So that's your vineyard. Your family is your vineyard. Your children, your offspring, that's your vineyard. This church is a vineyard. It was given to me by men before me. And it's my responsibility to hand it down to the next generation when I'm done. To hand it down either the same as or in better shape than what I got it from. And I can tell you that anything that I do in this church, it will end up in better shape than when I got it. Those of you who were here at the time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We were in bad shape. It is by the grace of God that we are what we are right now. So I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns. We talked about that in Sunday school, didn't we? Thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. Thorns are the things in your garden that don't belong in your garden. Thorns are the things in your flower bed that don't belong in your flower bed. They're the things in your lawn that you don't want in your lawn. They're things in your life that are sins in your life. And sin will grow over the goodness that God wants to do for you. Will it not? It will encompass you. It will take you over and leave nothing behind. Men, you're, the going to, you're always going to be the target, men. You're always going to be the primary target of the devil. Always. Simply because you're the band that keeps the hus together. You know what the word hus is? House. You know how Swedish people talk. Hus. You are the house band. 
You're the one tying it all together. The family revolves around the husband. That's the way, hey, thank you. That's the way God is. Hey, is not Jesus the husband? Does it revolve around us? It's all supposed to be about him, isn't it? Uh, moms and dads, husbands and wives, Ephesians 5, we're fixing to get into that in Sunday school. That's how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be Christ and his church. Christ and his church. Nothing else is what we're supposed to be. So thorns covered it over. Nettles had covered the face thereof. And, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. How did that happen? You went to sleep. You went to sleep. You got lulled in by sin. Lulled in disobedience to God. Disobedience to being a traitor to your own family. Turning against your church. Turning against God's word. Turning against God eventually. The stone wall was broken down. And you did nothing to stop it. Much less, you did nothing to build it back. I mean, things happen. I get it. I get it. Things happen in our lives, guys. That doesn't mean that we have to submit and succumb to that and live under it all of our lives. God put it in us, men, to stand up. Amen. It's in us to take a stand on something. Listen. I'm, I'm not a fighter, but stuff bristles me the wrong way, and I just want to deck somebody. But I don't want to. But there are stands that have to be taken. Issues that you say, this far and no more. I'm not taking anything else. I'm not taking any more. I've had it. This is enough. Right here, you take a stand. That stone wall gets broken down. Then, here's, here's Solomon now. Then I saw, and I considered it well, I looked upon it and received instruction. That's what you're supposed to be doing. And so, here's Solomon's summation of this. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. In other words, they used to call them highwaymen. That's where the phrase highway robbery comes from. Because the roads back then were not secured. They were not protected. And anybody traveling on a deserted road faces the risk of being robbed by highwaymen. That's why they called them that. There's a road now that goes from Nairobi to Samburu, where one of our radio stations is. We traveled it uh, under heavy guard. I am now told that that road has become so dangerous because there is a, there is a tribe in that area that does nothing but terrorize that road. They'll kill people, they'll stop vehicles, rob whatever they want, and you're lucky if you make it where you're going alive. In some cases, the military doesn't even like to go up there. That's how dangerous it is. So that's what he's talking about. You're asleep while the devil is in the process of stealing your children away from you. Think about it. You're asleep. You got drunk. You're busy on the internet. You are uh, taking drugs. You say, well, it doesn't bother anybody but me. Well, we're reading right here. That's not true. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hand. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. You'll wake up one day without your wife or your husband, without your family, 
And you'll wonder how it all went down. Went down because you fell asleep on the job. Amen? One more verse. Turn to Isaiah 7. I'll give you a little wisdom and I'll cut you out of here. Isaiah 7. Look at that wall on there. <clears throat> That's the wall that you built, or let's say your, your forefathers built, to protect his flocks, to protect his fields, and to protect his family. But it got torn down. And nobody, nobody came and fixed it back up again. Nobody did. They just let it crumble. What we're seeing in America is a crumbling of our way of life, aren't we? And that has to do with the walls and the borders. It has everything to do with it. We're letting people into this country and we're not insisting that they, we don't, we don't mind them bringing some of their culture with them, some of their food. But number one, learn English. Amen. I can say that, can't I? Amen. Learn English. Um, become a citizen, or at least get here legally so you can work and earn your own way. And pay your taxes. And... Vote responsibly. Amen. You see, we are having, we've got so many holes in our nation that we're just deteriorating right in front of the world. Well, in every other nation, they, they can hold on to their language, they can hold on to their culture, and it's not a crime to say, well, I'm Irish, or I'm Scottish, or I'm British, or I'm Spanish, or I'm French. Nobody looks down on them. But you say, I'm an American, and all of a sudden you're full of hate. Ought not be so. Didn't used to be that way. Now notice this. Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah. One, two, three. They represent lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Those are the three things that will destroy each and every one of us here in this room and those of you watching online and those of you listening. It will destroy you. It'll destroy your family. It'll destroy your reputation. It'll destroy your testimony. Any good thing that you've done for God, those things can be easily destroyed by your own unrighteousness. Read Ezekiel 33 if you want some education on that. God said that in the day that a righteous man transgresses, all of his righteousness is gone. So there goes your scales of how you got good deeds against your bad deeds. The last time you cursed, the last time you looked at something you shouldn't look at, or you did something you shouldn't have done, God took away all your righteous deeds, and now you have none. All you got is sin. Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee. Do you believe that there is a conspiracy against Christ and his word? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let us go up against Judah. That would be us. And vex it. That means to get in our face at, like, like um, Lot. The Bible says Lot was vexed with Sodom. If I lived in Sodom, I would be vexed too. That means that he was confronted with their sins daily. And there wasn't a thing he could do about it. He hated to even leave his own house because of the things that he would see between young and old in the streets of Sodom. And are we not now Sodom? We are. Let us make a breach therein for us after they vex it and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. The whole part of setting a king in the midst of it is 
that the devil wants to establish a different authority in your life. It's not God's authority. It's not his Ten Commandments. It's not his holy law. It's cruel authority. Now, it's authority that will let you move to Portland, take all the drugs you want to take, um, sleep with whoever you want to sleep with, shack up with whoever you want to shack up with, live like an absolute dog, and you're supposed to find happiness in that. Is Portland a happy town right now? There's dung on the sidewalks everywhere you walk. Homeless people, corner to corner, in Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, you name it. It's everywhere there. And they're not happy. That's why they take drugs. They think that's going to make them happy. It doesn't. It makes them worse. And so, yes, there is a conspiracy against you personally, you personally, to get inside your heart to set up a different king than Jesus. If I were you, I'd be on my guard. I can tell you by experience that when you let your guard down, the devil will seek to move right in. He abhors a vacuum. If he sees the throne empty, I guarantee you he's going to set about to sit on the throne of your heart. Don't let him do it. Your family's at stake. Your very life, your very eternity and where you're going to spend it is at stake. Would you stand please? Three minutes early. I want to have a word of prayer. I will open up these altars. I'm not going to drag out an altar call. I'm just simply going to say I want you to ponder those things that you've heard today. Think on these things, the Apostle Paul said. Think on these things. Apply them to your heart. Ask, ask God, God, is this me? I almost bet you you're, the answer is going to be yes. In some area of your life, the devil has built a stronghold against you. And he's breached God's law that keeps you in. He's breached that. And you let him do it. You let him do it. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We ask you, God, Lord, to remind us this week of the things that we've heard today. As we leave this place and go to our homes, remind us of the things that we heard today, things that we read from your word. Lord, these things are true and right. And now that we see how disobedience and forsaking your law, we see how that can lead to our destruction, the destruction of everything that's precious to us, our family, our country, our church, our faith, our way of life, everything that we hold dear is about to be destroyed right in front of our very eyes. And there's nothing more sobering than that, God. I've faced that numerous times. And Father, I ask God that you visit with each and every one who's heard this voice this morning, including my heart. And God, that you deal with us accordingly. And Father, if any one of us are in any way become slothful to your word, slothful against our family, slothful against our country, slothful against our church. And we're not putting in our share of prayer time, Bible reading, Bible study, Bible meditation. God, that you would deal with us. 
And Father, in the days to come, we would want more of you and not less. For where you are, you, Jesus, are the repairer of the breach. And your word is the stones that make up the wall that gives us protection. Father, help us to fall in line with your word. Forgive us of our sins, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming this morning.